Thank you so much, Claire. So one of Zoom's new um, features is that when it records, it has that lovely voice telling you that it's being recorded. So I just wanted to um, basically warmly welcome you all to this event, this virtual care opinion event. So it's, it's all about implementing care opinion in Scotland. Um, so just for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Pip Brennan and I'm the Executive Director of the Health Consumers Council in Western Australia. Um, I am actually from home, you might be able to tell that I'm from home with my banner behind me. Um, so just before we begin, I just would like to just take a moment to take a breath and to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are meeting with um, virtually. Where I am is Perth or Borloo, the uh, land of the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation. I'd like to um, extend respect to all um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, because I know there are people from not just um, here in Perth, uh, it's 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 uh, reconciliation week and and um, what well, reconciliation week was last week and it's a really important reminder to us that um, the importance of um, acknowledging and celebrating Aboriginal people across our beautiful country. So um, I'm rather excited um, to be able to introduce you to, um, to to bring you together for this session tonight. So we've, we've got just an hour and it's um, we're, we're trying to get through quite a bit of um, content. So um, before I go on to our um, guest speakers, um, I just wanted to do a very quick introduction to the topic of what, what we're discussing tonight. So I've just done a really super quick um, and simple PowerPoint, which I will get back to the front of. So um, hopefully you're in the right place because we're here to talk about um, implementing care opinion in Scotland. And as you can see, we've got um, uh, Jason Leach and Sean Ma here to, to join us. Um, so these um, two professionals uh, very kindly have given their time to come and talk to us. Um, really, I, I think uh, there's there's a lot of interesting parallels between Scotland and Australia in terms of um, you know the possibilities of the care opinion tool. And as they're, they're a bit further down the track, I thought it'd be interesting to to um, have a conversation with them. I've actually had the privilege of meeting both of these people in person. I uh, visited them. Was, we were discussing it was 2019, which does feel like another world away. And I did go and visit them because I wanted to I wanted to meet. Professor Leach and just talk a little bit more with him about his comment about how important care opinion has been implementing a person-centred um, health and social care sector in Scotland. So, and here we are. Um, I have already done the acknowledgement of country, but what I wanted to just double check is I wanted to double check that everybody was, um, was aware of what care opinion is. I know I'd sent out to you a, um, a, um, a link to the Care Opinion website, but I thought it, I would take just five, five seconds of your time um, just to quickly do that so that so that the conversations we have make a little bit more sense. So um, I also just wanted to give just a little bit of a why, why would a consumer advocate be so interested in this tool? And there's a few really key reasons why. So this is the tool here. Um, and it's, so basically it's an independent, moderated platform. So Care Opinion is a non-profit organisation. It's based in Queensland in Australia. This is a nationwide platform and it is both for health and social care services. That's that's the potential of it. What, um, as a consumer advocate, what I love was the fact that it is so action-based. Um, hey, Paul, it's going to, I'm sorry, everyone's going to hear it. So sorry, I'll, be, I'll be finished in five. Um, so basically it, um, it has the, um, the action cycle from the story being told, the story being listened to, the story being responded to, and the change being made. So I guess I guess there's so much that can happen around patient feedback, which um, which can can essentially be um, you know more about process than it is about outcome. But this tool is really about outcome. I as a, as a consumer advocate, I really like the fact that it, that it's in the public domain because it means that that there is there's a real opportunity for people to both, you know, see when something has happened that may not have been what people have wanted, but there's been a really good response, and also to, to celebrate um, the the good things that have happened. And I know that um, our guest speakers have a 
have even better stats, but, but usually it's at least 50% of stories are positive. So these are some of the, um, these are some of the, the reasons why, why I personally have been so interested in this tool and why um, as part of the Sustainable Health Review there's um, a consideration around the expansion of care opinion. And that there's a few different things that we're thinking about. And that's thinking about it being, um, you know, perhaps more stories being told, perhaps um, we could expand it out from hospitals to the social care sector. So that's really what, um, what we were thinking about in terms of, um, you know, tonight's conversation. And I, but just the very last thing, I, just before I hand over, I wanted to talk a little bit about, if I can get the right document up, is um, essentially, this is um, that we, in West Australia, we do have every single public hospital is on the care opinion platform through a subscription model. And um, we have a dashboard which tells us um, about, you know, where, where we're at across our hospital system. So that's our public hospital system. So this was, the, as you can see, that's a financial year of 2019 to 20. So that was the, the stories that have been told. And here's also a bit of a thing that gives us a sense of how does it, how does it look across the different area health services. So it goes, you know, from obviously Pathwest is quite new, but um, child and adolescent health service is fairly small. But look at WA Country Health Service with its 693 stories, even though per capita that's going to be a lot more numbers. So just to let you know, Pip, that your screen has stopped sharing, so we can't see oh, what you're sorry. talking through. Terribly sorry. Uh, I'm not good at this screen share. Share screen. I'm so you sorry. Pip. You can see me yabbering, but not the not the screen. Sorry. Go again. Sorry, can you see that now? Can you see that now? Yes. Yes, so sorry. But if you have a look at this screen here, this is from the dashboard that we have in, in WA. So you can see that that how, how many stories are being told. There's a lot of um, opportunities for, for there to be more stories told across the system. So, that's just a real snapshot. I hope that makes sense about the care opinion tool uh, while we're having a conversation about it tonight. And um, what I'd like to do now is I would like to properly introduce our speakers. So um, the, the um, first speaker tonight is Sean Ma. And so Sean, um, I know you've got a very fancy title, but um, I can't remember what it is, but um, I was wondering if, if I can hand over to you to um, introduce yourself. Because I'm the sure. worst host in the world. <laughs> so uh, great! It's great to be with you all this evening, and um, looking forward to a conversation around care opinion. One of my most favourite things, care opinion. Um, my my job is basically as a as a, a clinical advisor for person centred care with the Scottish government. So uh, working with policy teams, um, working with the system uh, to focus on on more person centred approaches to health and social care and also to, to the quality improvement work that we do. And my background, profession, I'm a nurse, worked for 24 years in, in intensive care mainly as a nurse. So um, yeah, uh, and for the last seven years or so, uh, eight years now, I've been working uh, in national roles doing this, this type of thing. Um, do, do Jason, does Jason want to introduce himself just now as well while we're at it? And then, uh, and then I can get into... Um, Yes, just please. Watch, so he's, just, just take away the suspense of him sitting there for another five, ten minutes while I'm talking, wondering who he is. <laughs> Surely people know who I am. What's wrong? They don't know who I am. So thanks, Sean, and thanks, Pip. Thanks for inviting us. We're, we're delighted to continue to spread the word of something that we think has been transformational in Scotland's approach to person centred care. So I'm Jason Leach. I'm the National Clinical Director of the Scottish Government. I'm one of three senior clinicians in the healthcare system inside the government, the chief medical officer, the chief nurse, and the national clinical director. I'm a dentist and oral surgeon who then went to the States for a little while, did a public health degree, and ended up back being part-time surgery, part-time bureaucrat, now full-time bureaucrat. So uh, COVID has changed my career a little bit, I hope uh, not permanently, but somewhat uh, obsessed with it temporarily, and I, in peacetime, run the quality bit of the healthcare system, hence Sean in person centre care, 
We have people doing patient safety. We have people doing effective care. You get the idea, cancer plans, all of that. And Sean has led along, and he'd be the first to say, a team of others, a relationship with Care Opinion UK, which is our version, and Care Opinion Scotland. And we're the first country in the world to invest in Care Opinion for a whole health system. And uh, Sean can talk through that, and I'm very happy to answer questions as time passes. Thank you Great. so much, everybody. So I'm just going to share my screen a second and get these slides up. So everyone see those slides okay? Yeah. Good. Good. So, um, so first of all, I'm going to just give you a couple of bits of information about why we, uh, why we chose Care Opinion. Um, the, the, the big thing, Jason said, you've got these three senior clinicians in, our, in, in government, the National Clinical Director, the Chief Medical Officer, Chief Nurse, we've got Chief Pharmacist, Chief AHPs. Uh, we have a very strong professional voice in the healthcare system. Where's the Chief Patient, Chief Family? Uh, where's that voice and how strong is that voice in the system? And so, um, you know, we, we recognise as people who are very focused on quality, that that is absolutely at the core, at the heart of of what makes a quality system is being able to listen if, uh, effectively to the voice of those people who use uh, the services, who are the recipients of, the, of all the things that we do. And um, we're always looking, we were always looking and continue to look for ways to, to, to enhance and strengthen that voice. And Care Opinion is one of the ways that we do that. And it's, it's, it's one of the, it's, and it's a really good way um, uh, it's, it's added a, a huge dimension to our um, uh, quality quality efforts, but also assurance and regulation of the health system as well. It's very helpful uh, in respect of those aspects. And Deming himself recognised that one of the greatest wastes in any system was failure to listen to the voice, the voice of the staff in the system, but also, and I think most importantly, uh, the voice of, of patients and families in, in, in our in the context of our consideration here this afternoon, this evening. So um, what, what, why, um, what is it, that, what's the USP that we saw in Care Opinion? Well, we've got lots of different ways that we try to listen effectively to people. And here's on the screen just now, one of the ways that we do that, and I'm sure you do as well, um, patient experience surveys. And this is uh, real data from one of our patient experience surveys, questions that I'm sure you probably ask in your surveys as well, a rating type score question. And you can see here that this patient has given us the most positive possible response to each of these questions. And what this team did was they went back and found these people and asked them again and said, just tell us a story about your experience of care. The same experience, tell us a story about the same experience of care that you gave us these ratings on. So here's, I'll just put it up on the screen, let you read it for a few seconds. Here's what the same patient said about the same experience of care when they were asked to tell a story about their experience. So it's quite striking, the difference between the right-hand side of the screen and the left-hand side of the screen. On the right-hand side of the screen, we don't make any improvements. We give ourselves a pat on the back and we carry on as before. The left-hand side of the screen, we stop and we think, oh my goodness, we, shouldn't have, we should have spotted that. We should have known that needed to be sorted. And actually now we can do some quality improvement. We can collect some quantitative data. You know, we can look at buzzer response times. We can look at reasons why people buzz. We can do all sorts of, you can see how down in the microsystem, Care Opinion suddenly helps us uh, to do some very meaningful and powerful improvement work that makes a real difference to people's experience of care. And that's what we saw with Care Opinion. And I think that is one of the most powerful elements of Care Opinion, its ability to connect us to the real experiences of people uh, in the healthcare system. And we can talk much more about that, but I won't because what we want to talk about here as well is the implementation. And we can come back to this in Q&A. I think some of the questions reflect on some of this. And we have some examples of of improvements, very simple uh, improvements. But if you imagine lots of very simple, small improvements happening at scale in the system, it has a big impact. So how did we go about implementation? Well, uh, Jason, as Jason said, we, are the, we were the first country in the world to have a whole healthcare system. 
uh, subscribe to something like Care Opinion, which is a not-for-profit, not actually owned or connected to the healthcare system, stands alone. Um, we have 14 territorial health boards that you know, deliver healthcare to populations, and then we have a number of uh, eight or so special boards, which uh, some of which are provide patient-facing services and others provide support services like education or payroll and all of those types of things, procurement. And what we did, we just went for the, the whole, we sort of did a top-down, bottom-up type approach. So the top-down push from us was, you're all subscribed, you're all on it. Um, but there were kind of two levels. There was kind of a basic level, you're on it, and now stories are gonna start coming in and you can see them and respond to them. And then there was an enhanced level where care opinion, they could invite care opinion in, and we would provide a bit more resource for them to do some promotion locally um, and so on. And that was quite a good way for us to see who were the, who were the early adopters and who was engaging and who, who did we perhaps go and see and, and give a bit more support to, to see uh, what, what, what they needed to help. Um, what, what, what we also have um, with health and social care integration now, we have, is it 32, I think, or 33 uh, integration joint boards, which are a, a mixture of health and social care, the big health board, but also a number of local authorities, local councils within that area that provide social adult social care and, and, and other similar services. And we've gone for a different model with them. So they, um, uh, the health board is subscribed and there's some crossover with, uh, with some of the services that are provided by the healthcare and the local authority. And then the uh, a number of the integration joint boards are now signing up as well but we haven't done a national subscription for them they are they're doing it on a voluntary basis and there's a, there's a steady um uptick now of those ijbs uh, signing up and subscribing to care opinion as well um what what was the benefit of what was the downside the downside was it felt a bit top about like being done to you know we did we we went against our principles in some ways because you know we're all about doing things with people and uh, we kind of did care opinion to the health boards but we did uh, engage and communicate and have involvement we ran a pilot with three of our health boards before we went for the for the big bang if you like of everybody being subscribed um, we didn't go for big public um, information campaigns. Uh, we've just let it be a steady, a slow burn over the last seven or eight years. And I think that has been beneficial as well, giving people time um, to adjust to, to care opinion. What about the providers themselves? What were their concerns? Because there were concerns, and I'm sure some of your providers um, will have concerns too. Principal among them was anonymity. They were worried about this the problem that people are anonymous. How can I how can I engage with an anonymous anonymous faceless individual? And um, so there was some concern about that. Um, exposure to being shamed and uh, you know public reputation uh, was a was an issue that some were concerned about as well. Um, and you used to hear terms like opening the Pandora's box or being overwhelmed with a tsunami of feedback or just another place for people to complain. Needless to say, none of these things have materialized. It's, it, it's, it's a, it, the survey response example I gave you at the beginning is a good example of that vulnerability that people feel, uh, or sometimes gratitude, and they kind of give you that false assurance in those survey type responses. And what the anonymity does, it allows the person to give you that honest feedback and to feel safe doing that. So you get to find out, Mary, a lady, Mary Dixon Woods, an academic medical sociologist, she talks about fugitive knowledge in your system, there's fugitive knowledge, the things that you don't know you don't know. And what Care Opinion helps you to do is to push into that space and find that fugitive knowledge that helps you to do that really meaningful improvement in your system. So none of these concerns really were, were have been a problem. There was not a tsunami of complaints. 70% of our stories are positive on Care Opinion. Uh, there's around 4,000 stories a year now. Um, uh, the what these stories being in the public domain does it builds trust uh, and enhances public reputation of organizations rather than damaging um, public reputations and the other key factor which is a really important thing with care opinion to their credit is the quality of the moderation so very high quality moderation with care opinion which gives that assurance and confidence to the providers to the organizations that um, uh, you know it's safe and it's okay to have this information going out and they're not going to suddenly get hit with something if there's something that's quite sensitive and difficult they'll get some advanced warning 
uh, and, and an opportunity to prepare. Um, what else have we got here? That's my mouse has stopped. Here we go. So here's some information about where we are today. All of our providers have now moved to the enhanced subscription, um, which is a more sort of active promotion of care opinion in our organization. On average, nationally, about 400 stories a month, uh, as you're saying, just over 4,000 stories a year, uh, 750,000 stories read per year on the website about Scottish health and social care system, 1,800 staff in the system responding, and 70% of stories entirely positive. Next, uh, this is just a little slide that shows as well how Scotland is doing in terms of its responsiveness to the feedback on care opinion. And you can see that Scotland and Northern Ireland who have both gone for a national approach and promoting a distributed responding network in the organisation. So having clinical teams able to respond, not just managing it centrally through corporate comms, um, uh, leads to very high response rates uh, because staff have ownership of their services and the stories that come in about them. What next? Uh, we want to use this more to inform our quality improvement work. We want more staff responding at the point of care, more promotion of care opinion at the point of care, and greater public awareness generally. I think you walk down a high street in Glasgow or Edinburgh and ask 20 people if they've heard of care opinion, you might get one or two. Um, you know, if, if, if even 50% of the people in Scotland knew about care opinion, we would have tens of thousands of stories a year. So, um, but we've got to build that capacity in our system to be able to respond and use that meaningfully. So I think it's the right way to take the sort of the, um, the slow burn approach. Um, we have a care opinion dashboard like you do too. Um, and just one final point. Uh, I think the, the biggest thing for me about care opinion is that it designs the space for attentive. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, an intentional um, way to design attentiveness back into your healthcare system. So we need to, we do that at the individual level with the, you know, what matters to you approach with individuals, but care opinion is a way for an organization, for a state, for a country to be attentive to the experiences of, of service users. And I'll stop there because I've been speaking for 10 minutes and that's long enough. And I want to give you time for questions and I've been rattling through it hundred miles an hour. So hopefully you managed to pick pick up some useful information there and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Sean. That, I really enjoyed that. That was um, not a rattle through. I, I found it to be really interesting. I just wanted to double check because I did have somebody online saying, oh, is Pip going to explain how this relates to patient opinion? So for everyone online, patient opinion and care opinion are one and the same. They merged into the one platform in March 2020. And I'm so sorry. I'm such a care opinion nerd. I just assumed everybody knows that. Um, I was going to throw to you first, Jason. I remember you saying that that you know Scotland can be a little bit of a closed shop when it comes to you know embracing different um, you know initiatives like this. So what was it about? What was about the process of adopting care opinion? The, thanks, Sean. That was an excellent uh, introduction to to what's happened in Scotland. It's interesting to hear it back again. I haven't seen you do that for for a few months. The the interesting thing about Scotland is we're a relatively closed, centrally managed system. We have five and a half million people. We have uh, health boards who deliver the care, but in government, we, we manage the budget. We manage the annual contract with each of those boards. So to get into Scotland with a new initiative is quite tricky, but once you're in, you get the whole country. So if you want to sell a piece of software for primary care, you you can't do that in the individual primary care setting. You have to come to us and we would procure that for the whole country. So it annoys the companies who can't get in, but it's a, it's a fantastic way of getting in to, to do a whole population. And remember, I, I have no chief executives of hospitals. So I, ca I, can't, I can't introduce you to the lady who runs Glasgow Royal Infirmary. There is no such person. The person who runs Glasgow runs seven hospitals, all the community services, all of the public health, and she's called Jane Grant. She's the chief executive of the population health who happens to have seven hospitals. Now, clearly she has facilities wow. managers and other people who run the individual hospitals. So therefore care opinion for us has to work as a wraparound service. We, we, don't, we don't want a service that just helps Ward 4. That would be nice, but we want a service that, that embeds itself into the whole system. Now, getting there in one jump is impossible. And Sean's just illustrated how we did that very gradually. 
And we did it by getting a few enthusiasts in one of those health boards to go first. Our intention was to go to everybody because we had decided that this was one of the ways we were going to do person-centered care. So we had we had assessed it, we saw it worked, we had some enthusiasts, we also had uh, talked to them about Scottish staff and a Scottish office because we wanted the language to be appropriate, the understanding of, so we have no trusts. So why would the responses from professionals be about trusts? That makes no sense to us. So, so we wanted it to be locally usable. And that's what we did. We tried a few enthusiastic amateurs. Sean and I went round and talked to those early adopters. And then gradually you can see what's happened as Sean's done it. The, the, I, I illustrate that story often when I'm asked about with the two ends of the equation. One end is going around individual wards and community practices and hearing nurses, physiotherapists talk about care opinion, giving it out with appointment letters to people who come for their care. So it's at the bottom of the letter. And then at the other end, quite a, quite a famous day where we took care opinion to the Scottish Parliament. And we set up a stall for a week inside the Scottish Parliament. And every member of the Scottish Parliament could sign up to get care opinion updates from their constituency. Now that terrified the health boards to death. Can you imagine? Absolutely terrifying. <laughs> Giving your elected representative access to the raw stories from patients and families. But we knew that they would get 70% good stories. Whereas normally their inbox is full of 100% bad stories because that's all that's the only people who speak to politicians. You don't phone your politician to say, my hysterectomy was fantastic. You phone, your, you phone your politician to say, I waited too long, everybody was horrible to me, couldn't park my car, et cetera. So actually now a host of members of the Scottish Parliament get a, get a weekly or monthly update or even a daily update every time there's a story in one of their constituencies, which circles that whole feedback loop. It allows them to respond and say, thank you so much, that's fantastic. Or it allows them to take the case on as a constituency case, maybe something they have to talk to me about or a, a health board about. So, so I think those two ends illustrate, and everything in between, illustrate how we've tried to embed care opinion in, in everyday work. I'm going to ask some more safety and quality questions, but before I do, I wanted to just um, pick up on a question that's come through both from the registrations and um, from Kit, who's online tonight, just understanding a bit more about it's not just um, hospitals and health services, it's more, it goes out into the social care sector too. Am I right in thinking that? Mm. Yeah, we've even had actually, um, and Care Opinion have been really flexible with us on some of this. Uh, we've had stories told uh, by children at school. Um, you know, we had a, I can't remember the name of the program, it's to help them with transition from primary school, from junior school to high school. And these guys go in and do this, um, ac these activities with the kids to build their confidence and their networks. And they, they found Care Opinion. They just went on and told stories about their experience at school. So Care Opinion were like, what do you want us to do with these? Like, well, give the school guys the opportunity to feedback. So the people who are running the program fed back to these kids who told stories on Care Opinion through Care Opinion. So it's right across the health and social care system and <laughs> even some other dent dentists, um, dentistry, some good stories about dentistry stories about primary care, stories about social care and so on. So yeah, J Jason, what ex we've had some experiences of other, all sorts of things being uh, shared on Care Opinion. Um, the school one is the it's, it's, uh, Hospices as well. We, we introduced access for our hospice sector. The social care sector in Scotland is, is a little bit different from our health system. For those of you who know it, it's much more mixed. It's private, public. It's a, a, we don't own it like we own the National Health Service. So it's a little bit trickier, but Care Opinion lends itself to, to that method as long as you have responders who are sympathetic and a, a little bit of light training. And once they get enthusiastic about it, there's no stopping them. And patients, families, customers, whatever you want to call individuals, residents who, who can access that, there isn't any reason at all why it, it can't be used in all of these settings. What, what you need is a little bit of leadership in the local setting to kind of manage it. And I, it doesn't need two days a week. It just needs somebody to be enthusiastic about it and to learn a little bit about language, to a little bit of not to write, I'm sorry if you were upset, that, that would not be an appropriate sentence. Just to say, I'm sorry, 
he, he, here's what we think happened, and we'd love to hear from you about what happened. And remember, in, somebody somebody asks in the in the chat about how do you follow up with patients if, if it's anonymous. It's like TripAdvisor. They hate me calling it that, but you can you can have a conversation with the individual, so you can answer, and the anonymous individual can answer back. Now, if they want to go into another setting and start to send you emails or call or even visit, then you can arrange that. But it, just on care opinion, you can have a 10 message conversation with them to try and resolve whatever challenge it is that is they have, or to ask them more about the good story and say, that nurse you mentioned in, in, in that uh, general practice, who was really nice to you, can you just let us know their names so we can get back to them and tell them they did such mm -hmm. a good job? So you can have a conversation, even if they're called Pappy 106, we don't care. Mm -hmm. And and and, in that, and that the the nice one of the nice things about the positive stories on care opinion is, again, the quality of the moderation. They'll let the names go through, on the on the positive stories. If it's a difficult story, then care opinion are very careful to anonymize the story as well. So if the storyteller says Sean was so rude to me and Jason, while well, he was just an arrogant, ignorant so and so, they say, well, you need to take those out. You need to take out any reference to the gender of the individual and so on. So you can't tell who it is they're talking about necessarily in the story. So the, the, the quality of moderation there is um, is very good in that respect. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, I um, referred to it in the Care Opinion event that we had in Australia as that honest broker, which I think is really helpful. Um, there are, I'm just trying to think, which question do I pick next? Because there's, there's a few really juicy ones, but um, I might go to Anne White's question about, um, did Care Opinion Scotland have many issues raised regarding COVID-19 and the different waves? And I thought maybe that's more of a one for you, Jason. So I haven't been quite as uh, paying as much attention as I usually do because of the nature of my slightly crazy job just now. But the last time I looked, it, it had done exactly what you would expect it to do. It, it, has, it has reacted to the present healthcare system. And that, that's what it did pre-COVID. So if, if waiting times went up, we get more waiting time stories. If there is a crisis in adolescent mental health, we get more adolescent mental health stories. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of, a, what would you call it? A beacon for whatever's happening. So of mm. course there are more COVID stories. So there are some people complaining about lack of face-to-face -face interaction. And there are some people commending the fact they don't have to have face-to-face -face interaction and they, they can do it with electronic means. And there are, there are good and bad stories inside the COVID response, just like there are inside the cancer response conventionally. So it has adapted, but, it, but it, it, there aren't really any surprises last time I looked, unless Sean has seen more. No, you're, you're spot on. The main, there's been some core themes around separation from loved ones, but also access to loved ones, as Jason has said, through the virtual visiting that we've set up. The other, the other interesting thing is, I just looked back last night and ran a report, 71% of the stories are positive for, for the last 12 months when I looked, when I ran the report, which was, I didn't expect to see that, um, which was interesting. That's pretty sweet stats, isn't it? Very, we love that. Um, look, I wanted to go to, there's been a few questions that sort of talk around, um, you know, talking about patient safety and quality. And one of the questions was, can you comment on any other aspects of patient safety and quality culture that complement the role of care opinion? And delivering safe, high quality care. So, like, how is it? Obviously, that's a tool, but what else? It's, quite, it's difficult. I was going to say I'll jump in here, Jason, because I, there, there's a um, there's a bit of I'm research in the chat. I'm answering questions in the chat box. Oh, you keep going. Right, good. There's a, there's a bit of research going on with some colleagues at Aberdeen, the Health Services Research Unit, looking at the impact of care opinion on quality on them um, culture in healthcare teams. So looking at our boards, if you like, our, our providers who are the more, you know, the, who are the, the front end, the more enthusiastic boards who've been the trailblazers, uh, and they, they start to look a bit different to other health boards. So for example, one of our trailblazer boards um, looks different in the ombudsman's data. You know, they have fewer early presentations to the ombudsman in terms of complaints going straight to the ombudsman and bypassing the board. They're an outlier on the data on, on, on that data, which is interesting, which would seem to suggest that care opinion is, is there's something happening with care, which care opinion is helping with around that early resolution and relationship sort of trust building uh, that, that goes on. So I think that there's a it's difficult to measure this stuff and to, uh, you know, we, 
we don't necessarily have the know-how to detect the signal, but um, you know, anecdotally and around some sort of circumstantial evidence, there does seem to be an impact on team culture and, and overall safety quality approach of the organization and culture in the organization when care opinion rises to the fore as part of the mix. Remember it's not, so, so remember, it, so I've got a great friend in Sweden called Joran Henriks, and some people may have heard of him. He, he runs probably the finest health system in the world. Alaska would argue that they win that league table, but Jon Shipping in Sweden, a relatively small county council with 300,000 people, has some of the best outcomes pretty much on every graph you can imagine, both clinical, person-centered, everywhere else. And I once asked him, uh, who, how, how have they done that? And he looked at me as if I was stupid. And he answered in, in a kind of English, Swedish accent. He said, we just did everything. And I said, what on earth do you mean? He said, well, we did the critical care safety stuff. We did person-centered feedback. We did staff well-being. We did, so he just did everything. So care opinion isn't magic. Care opinion isn't the answer to all of your person-centered care challenges. It is one of a range of tools in Scotland that we have used that is now a crucial building block to allow us to be more person-centered. But it, by itself, it doesn't give you open visiting in your wards, for example, which I think is another crucial building block to have a person-centered care system. So, so it, but, but it has now, I, I wouldn't want to take it away, but it's, but it's one element in a, in a range of things that we've done in Scotland to try and make our care of a higher quality. It's been an excellent sort of positive disruptor, hasn't it? You know, it's uh, one of the things yeah. in the mix. It's a bit uncomfortable, but actually it takes us in a good direction. Um, I love me some positive disruption. Um, there has been a, a sort of a, a question just talking about, uh, you know, somebody wanting to hear about a vignette about how, how care opinion input um, resulted in a collaboration to create real change and improving people's um, and improving quality care in the NHS. I did chuck a couple of slides in actually, just with one tiny example of a really simple, I can share it if you want. It's a little timeline of a story. It's a very simple change and, and I'm sure Jason might have some as well, but we've got examples for example, for where the chief executive of the, the director general in the government has commented on a story about people smoking outside a hospital in Lanarkshire. You know, so there's, it, it by imagine the amount of bureaucracy there is between the person saying why do i have to walk through a wall of smoke going into the hospital and the director general in the scottish government um you know, that's a huge amount there's a, there's hundreds of people between those those you know between that member of the public and and that senior official and care opinion just <laughs> bypassed all of that straight up to the to the to to paul gray it was at the time we responded to that but let me just quickly share this and i'll show you because the pictures paint a thousand words, don't they? So this is the story, you won't be able to read it, but it says, I came to an appointment and the chair, I was sitting in the chair, the nurse came to the door, called my name. Uh, I couldn't hear because I've got a hearing problem and uh, I nearly missed my appointment and it was only because um, I happened to turn around and see the nurse and then saw the lips moving and then realized it was my name that was being called and the nurse thought this was funny and I you know I was a bit annoyed because you know why the chairs sitting with their backs to where the nurse comes out and calls people's names so they tell this story and Gwen who manages that service she's a senior nurse comes in and says I'm deeply sorry for the poor experience you had ophthalmology waiting area unacceptable to behave in this manner we're moving the position of the chairs and we're changing the practice of calling how we call people and i'll get back to you later today to let you know how we got on she then comes back we've now looked at the layout we've turned the chairs around and um we have them facing the reception desk to avoid future concerns and I'll feedback later today with any more findings and changes we can make <clears throat> to ensure patients are notified of their appointment appropriately, but also with care and compassion. <clears throat> and the person comes back and responds and says, thank you very much. So here's an example of an anonymous story. The person's identity is never revealed throughout and uh, the change is made. And the timeline of that was the story was published on day one. 
the initial response came the next day at 10.51. The change and the further response came the same day at 11.59. So the time from the story told to the change being made was less than 24 hours. So again, you know, it's a small thing, but imagine that happening hundreds and hundreds of times uh, all over the system. Uh, and that's the type of, and now, and, and we're lucky that the team actually put in that their change was made here because the biggest, one of the biggest challenges we have with care opinion is people, um, you know, they don't like to say, oh, I've made a change for some, I don't know whether it's humility or whether they're just a bit embarrassed that they, they should have got, they should have got this right in the first place. So often that we miss some of these changes, but when you read the stories and responses, you can see that changes have been happening. So I'll stop sharing there. So there's just one example and we could give you we went and spoke to the team, we could give you hundreds and hundreds of examples like that where changes are happening on the back of these stories being told. That's just one example. And there's there's lots like that. And then there's the, the almost abstract, putting patients and families into the conversation more. So telling those stories at board meetings, having the chief executive of the institutions write and respond, having the uh, members of the parliament see those stories. So, so it's, there are individual changes and one of the metrics we follow is number of changes versus number of stories, but it is not the whole answer. So some, some of the broader cultural change happens because you ask, just because you're open and transparent. You, you, you get, you, your culture begins to change as part of a longer process, as well as those individual changes. There's a, there's a terrific story I often tell of a gentleman who was a long, a long term patient we had removed the, uh, the cart that used to come round the wards from the shop because the cross-infection police didn't like it. And he wanted a daily newspaper. He couldn't get his daily newspaper. That was one of the things he craved because he was in hospital for so long. So within a few days, they brought the cart back and he got his daily newspaper every day, along with lots of sugary drinks and chocolate bars, unfortunately. <laughs> but that's a, that's a different Scottish problem. But he, he, he simple, simple individualized change leading to broader cultural change. The other thing we notice with that is the is the the tone of the dialogue. So you look at those exchanges. It's a human being speaking to a human being, not the face of an organization speaking to a human being, which is often what you get with the formal complaints process. It feels dehumanizing. It doesn't feel personal. Um, whereas one of the bits of you know, the training, light, the light training that Jason talked about that people get when they're taught how to use care opinion is just be a human being when you respond to people. Don't be the face of the organization. It's okay to say, I'm sorry, that is awful. Um, and we want to make sure that never happens again. It's okay to say that. There's no public li liability that comes with that um, and so on. So, you know, I, I think the, the humanizing effect of care opinion is one of the one of the strengths of it as well. That segued perfectly into one of the questions that came through from the registration registrants, which was about training. What sort of training did you put in place as you were um, embedding care opinion in? Care opinion themselves kind of did a lot of this initially. So they would go around and you'd get a key individual in the organisation who would kind of be the lead. And then they would distribute, they would then, you know, so it's kind of like a train the trainer model. So the care opinion lead for Scotland uh, from care opinion themselves would go around, do a bit of responding training. And sometimes we could do that as a collective uh, with people, uh, maybe bring a few leads from a few different providers together. Here's, here's good, here's, and show them examples like that. Here's some good responses. Here's some not so good responses. Um, and, and very much the emphasis on just be a human being, be a person. And so and it was very and, and provision of some you know marketing materials that type of thing but the training was really um you know not wieldy in any in any way shape or form and the creation of so so sean sean uh, typically typically humble also created a community of practice in a sense that that brought the people together who were the initial enthusiasts to help each other with tin, tips and tricks and it, we had exactly what you would anticipate we had some places saying no no this should be the complaints handlers who do this no no this should be the nurse director who answers all of these there's no way we're giving this to nurse on the ward there's absolutely no way we're letting her answer that's crazy and then gradually 
as Nurse on the Ward began to answer, and it turned out he and she were better than the complaints manager at defusing the situation, turns out. But of course, there were some that escalated and got troublesome and ended up with the complaints handler, of, co of course. But, but the, the devolving power downwards through the system works. But you have to have a little bit of courage to, to make that happen. And you have to support the staff to say, even if you get this wrong, we will have your back. We, we will cover for you and we will, we will correct what, if it gets away from you and this, this doesn't go the way we think it's going to go. But in the main, if you behave like a human being and an adult, it turns out the other person is usually a human being and an adult too. Yeah, and there's moderation on. The, and there's mod, I was going to say there's moderation on the responses too. So if you if you do make a big zero of it, you know uh, the care opinion guys come and say you might just want to. Have you wondered? You know, have you thought about maybe this could be phrased a little bit differently, or you know that type of thing? So they'll help you out a bit as well. They're keeping an eye on what's going back and forth. Yes, I was just about to pipe up and say, um, you know, moderation is, is what the care opinion organisation does. I was just going to pick up too, because it's, it's a bit back in the chat, but Carrie was sort of asking about, you know, does it, how does a moderator, you know, deal with vexatious um, commentators and, and that kind of thing. And there is, there is a space where, I mean, there is a moderation policy for care opinion. And um, I actually met with Care Opinion Australia in... Um, March of last year just to say you need to have some consumer involvement in your moderation policy so we've now got a national reference group which has both staff and consumers you know having a look at digging into things like moderation policy um, because you know it, it, these things are are a bit of a you know are an, are an evolving piece but there is a space where um, say if someone wants to keep going back and keep going back and keep going back they will say look no we're not going to keep posting so so you know there there is an element of that but it's but as Jason has said in the chat, it's nowhere near as big as you think. And this tool isn't the right tool for when something, you know, like there's been a really serious incident. This is this is not the right tool for that, I would say. I don't know if you would agree with that, Sean, but that certainly in Australia, that's not, it doesn't work that well in that space. Yeah, no, we've had, we have examples where there's a big formal complaint process going on and the person also posts a story on Care Opinion and the team will come in and say, look, we note that you've, You've uh, you've got a formal complaint going, and we're gonna we're gonna deal with this through that process uh, type of thing. So you know, I think, uh, or <clears throat> sometimes the um, you know you've had some some things where there's kind of maybe potentially been legality uh, legal issues involved, and the care opinion guys will say, well, look, that's this isn't the platform for that. Uh, you need to go through a different channel and uh, and direct them away from care opinion. So again, that quality of moderation is um, is key in all of this. Yeah, Rebecca sort of asked that question about um, how services audit the responses for their quality. In a way, it's kind of easy because they're out there in, in the public domain, but I guess the question's a bit more about how do you make sure the right responses are going out? So the, I'm guessing that's a bit of a mix between staff training and plus the care opinion moderators. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's uh, you know, you're going to make mistakes. People make mistakes, and it, and something sometimes responses slip through that aren't, aren't aren't great. You know, and there's not a lot you can do with some of them. You know, thank you for your feedback. We have a formal feedback service here. It is type of thing, and if that's what the some boards are, doing, you know, not not in Scotland thankfully anymore, but uh, you know, if you look at some of the in England where it's a much more laissez faire type approach. Uh, where stories are told, you know, they just get fobbed off, and um, you know that that uh, that goes through, and that's I suppose a reflection of what's going on in in the organisation's concern. But we don't have those types of responses uh, in Scotland anymore, uh, which is good. Don't don't over design don't over design it. Don't don't mm. try and squeeze it into traditional feedback and complaints mechanisms. So how about not auditing it? That's a radical idea. How about letting it run for a little while and seeing how it goes? I know it's terrifying because we're so used to managing and controlling it all. So, so it won't be perfect. But our experience is it, it will go much better than you expect. And there might be a few mavericks on either side of the communication barrier, of course. But let's not make the rules to, to manage the mavericks. Let's make the rules for the vast majority of people who find it supportive and helpful. If you were if you were going to manage Twitter based on the trolls, you, you would shut it down. But actually, it's it's a useful way of getting information out to the public if you ignore all the nonsense. 
Yeah, it's like it's like most things. Here, no, I was going to say no. I was just going to say the sky doesn't fall in. You know, uh, there's lots of people who uh, lots of lots of people. There are a vocal minority of people who think the sky will fall in if you do something like this, and it doesn't. It's the same. You know, Jason referred to the visiting policies. You know, open visiting policies. You get the similar sort of response to that. You know, the sky will fall in. We will be overwhelmed. Infections will be spread all over the hospital, and it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Mm. Look, there's a question here, um, that a really juicy one I want to get to. It's from Susanna. It's talking about, you know, patient reported outcome measures and patient reported um, experience measures. It does care opinion have any role to play in assisting in the collection of these? Well, I'm going to speak personally. I think it's better <laughs> because it's not us asking them to talk about the things we want them to talk about. It's people talking about the things that matter to them. So you get a raw, pure outcome measure, if you like, from uh, from care opinion. It's not that proms and prems have no no role, um, but they're different, you know. And often proms, in particular, uh, they come out of a very academic environment. You know, they're created in a in a in a kind of a laboratory almost type environment, and they're about the things that we as professionals and clinicians want to find out about. And it's not that those things aren't important. But they're not necessarily, and in fact, perhaps quite often, they're not the same things that really matter to, to patients and, and their families. You know, so did your wound heal and can you climb three steps uh, might not be the most important outcome after a hip replacement. It might be I can kneel down in my garden and I can play football with my grandkids. You know, so that's what you'll get from care opinion, uh, which feels much more powerful, if I'm honest, than did my wound heal and can I climb three steps. Um, so. You know, it's not that I don't think, I think they're complementary um, uh, and they're different. That's the point. I just want to flag that it's um, 6.25 by my time. And I believe, Jason, that you needed to get off to your next meeting. I do. That would be really helpful for me. But I'm, I'm, I'm loath to leave because I like talking about this. It's much better than my normal job. <laughs> I know. This is much more positive. <laughs> so I'll leave, I'll leave you in Sean's capable hands. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. He's such a busy man. Thank you. Um, so, so I thought Susanna might follow up with that when she says, Sean, a good um, patient reported outcome measure would ask what, about what's of value to the patient. So I'm guessing that's, an, that's another kind of really interesting thread. I personally, you know, I'm still trying to understand a bit more. So I, I was interested in what you said about, you know, proms kind of being developed almost in a laboratory. And I don't know. If you've got experiences yeah. of how else it could be done. So I'm, I'm, I'm obviously speaking in general terms, but, you know, if you look at the majority of proms, they tend to have a clinical focus. Uh, they tend to talk about, they tend to ask about things that matter to us, and they tend to be, um, you know, they tend to be fairly narrow in, in scope. If there's an element of a prom which says, did you get what you expected and what did you get what you needed and wanted from this intervention that we've done to you or with you? Then, then obviously that would be a good thing. But again, as well, you're you're also, um, you know, it depends on how your sampling works and everything. But uh, care opinion, you're going to kind of get. Um, I, I often think with care opinion, if you think about a normal sort of bell curve distribution, if you use care opinion a little bit, you tend to get stories from the two tails of the distribution curve. So either very very good or very very poor experiences. And as you increase the volume of stories, you kind of push into what is the general a general reflection of the experience of the population using the using the service and i think that's where we've seen you know at the beginning maybe only 30 to 40 percent of the stories were positive because we were collecting stories from the tales of the distribution people would find care opinion who were really fed up or really delighted and as we've got better at promoting and, and public awareness starts to grow and or, or clinical services promote care opinion, then you start to see a, perhaps a more reflective distribution of the of the actual experiences. So it's a useful tool to use alongside something like PROMS, I think, um, to sort of enrich uh, uh, and to check that you're not missing anything important. So I think I, I'm, I'm not I'm not um, against PROMS and PREMS. I think that they again, these are different things um, uh, and they have. They, they, they are complementary rather than, um, you know, comp in competition. And I think you would um, use, just, if you do, yeah, if you don't have, if you didn't use care opinion and you only used proms or prems, or, or you only used care opinion and you didn't pay any attention to proms and prems, you know, you would miss out on both sides. 
I think I think you've answered Susanna's question. Just um, her next question was around how how to um, establish you know best practice rather than just looking at the two tails. And I think what I understood from that was you know as as the tool gets more um, you know ad adoption, then then you're going to get that larger curve. Mm -hmm. I was really curious about what you'd said about um, you hadn't done any public health campaigns around care opinion. It, it had been relied more on on the clini clinician promoting it. Do you think that that's something that you would like to do now? Or like, I think it was, was it the two in 20 in the street would know what care opinion is? I think that was probably an overestimate. Um, yeah, sorry, someone's, <laughs> asking, <clears throat> someone's asking in the chat, what are proms and prems? So, uh, the chat, there's some answers going in the chat for you there, um, Sharon. Sorry, we should have uh, avoided using that jargon. But uh, patient reported outcome measures and patient reported experience measures, <clears throat> and they kind of they tend to be academic instruments that are used in research to measure outcomes and experience. Um, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, no, we didn't go for a big national campaign, but some of the local providers did. So uh, for example, in in uh, in one of our health boards, the director of nursing was on the back of a bus, uh, with, uh, you know, the face of the director of nursing was on a poster. On, on the buses in the in the area saying, tell us your story on care opinion. Um, some have had radio advertisements in their, in their local area. So some providers who are the, so again, we wanted to kind of, we wanted to limit our top down approach, um, you know, cause it was kind of against our principles, but we, we wanted to make use of it in a good way if we could. And the good way to make use of it was to make sure that whole thing was, was kind of out there and everybody had access to it. And then we kind of have stepped back a bit. And now we're coming back in again, I think. And I think we're about to, especially post COVID, as we kind of react a bit, we're looking at, so how do we re-energize this movement because, um, around person-centered approaches and the voice of, of service users? And so I think we might, but the trouble is, the, the challenge we would face is that um, I think in the current world, you know, where access to social media is so widespread, there's two things. One is you could get a huge volume, which you then don't, you aren't able to listen to properly and respond to properly. So that would be number one. So you'd need to make sure you were adequately resourced to be able to respond and moderate and do all of the things you need to do. If suddenly you got 4,000 stories a month instead of 400 stories a month. The second thing is what we're aware of is, you know, care opinion, you can phone your story in or uh, get someone to describe your story for you, but predominantly it's a, it's a kind of a, a social media platform which means you're going to, you know, those people who are at the margins of society who don't have a voice, you know, you, you might be enhancing the voice of a one group of people at the expense of another group of people. And you're so, you know, you've got so much activity going on in that area that you actually miss out on hearing those other voices as well. So it's, 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 it's complicated and we're still very thoughtful about how we might do that and how we might manage it. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm just conscious of the time because I know I've or, or I already had you a bit longer than we were meant to. And just wanted to share one story um, from West Australia. Where it was around dialysis services in the middle of, um, you know, like a very remote area. And um, that story went right up to the federal health minister. So that was that was um, certainly somebody that you would consider potentially vulnerable, vulnerable and disadvantaged, but they'd worked in partnership with the trusted caregiver to get that story right up. So I think there's there are some great opportunities as well with care opinion. I, I'm, I'm actually going to close, but I just thought um, Lara had asked a question to me about how do I see care opinion fitting in with the 2019 Sustainable Health Review. It is a specific activity under the recommendation that I'm co-lead for, um, and, and it is actually about the expansion of care opinion. And, and as I, I was um, sort of expressing in the beginning, I see that both as working in the hospital system more effectively including the private hospital systems, including GPs and um, non-profits. That, that's the dream. So um, one of the things we're thinking about next, next is a, is a um, public, you know, public awareness campaign. So I might have another chat with you, Sean, offline, see if I can find out a little more about that. But um, I'm just conscious we, have, we are actually two minutes over time. I'm sure people have, have got evenings to go to. I just wanted to say, um, I want to say, Sean, thank you so much for your time. It was really, um, really in, um, engaging and interesting conversation and you also helped us create um, a resource because we've now got this this video that we can use to share with those people that weren't able to come tonight um, i wanted to thank all the people that have um, joined us online tonight thank you for all your questions both um, at registration and tonight and um, i hope we'll see you very soon online and maybe sean i'll see you in person at some time who knows 
Um, yeah, but yes, it's certainly been a very difficult time in the world, has it not? Indeed. So go Lo safe and go well. Thank you. Lovely to see you all and to spend some time with you. Bye-bye. Ciao. Thanks. Thank you.